our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Welcome to worship on this Sunday, September 13th. We are especially glad for those of you that are visiting. Let us worship God together.
confess our sin in the presence of God and with one another. Let us pray. Faithful God, have mercy on us. We confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We turn from your loving embrace and go our own ways. We pass judgment on one another before examining ourselves. We place our own needs before those of our neighbors. We keep your gift of salvation to ourselves. Make us humble, cast away our transgressions, and turn us again to life in you through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Sisters and brothers, hear the good news. God hears the cries of all who call out in need. And through his death and resurrection, Christ has made us his own. Hear the truth that God proclaims. Your sins are forgiven in the name of Jesus Christ. Led by the Holy Spirit, live in freedom and newness to do God's work in the world. Amen. O oh Lord God, merciful judge, you are the inexhaustible fountain of forgiveness. Replace our hearts of stone with hearts that love and adore you, that we may be light, delight in, your, in doing your will through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. This Christian community has significant struggles with diversity. Here, Paul helps us understand that despite different practices in worship and personal piety, we do not judge one another. All Christians belong to the Lord Jesus Christ, who died for all of us and will judge each of us. The second reading is from the book of Romans, the 14th chapter, beginning at the first verse. Welcome those who are weak in faith, but not for the purpose of quarreling over opinions. Some believe in eating anything, while the weak eat only vegetables. Those who eat must not despise those who abstain, and those who abstain must not pass judgment on those who eat, for God has welcomed them. Who are you to pass judgment on servants of another? It is before their own Lord that they stand or fall, and they will be upheld, for the Lord is able to make them stand. Some judge one day to be better than another, while others judge all days to be alike, let all be fully convinced in their own minds. Those who observe the day, observe it in honor of the Lord. Also those who eat, eat in honor of the Lord, since they give thanks to God. While those who abstain, abstain in honor of the Lord and give thanks to God. We do not live to ourselves and we do not die to ourselves. If we live, we live to the Lord. And if we die, we die to the Lord. So then, whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. For to this end Christ died and lived again, so that he might be Lord of both the dead and the living. Why do you pass judgment on your brother or sister? Or you, why do you despise your brother or sister? For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. For it is written, As I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall give praise to God. So then, each of us will be accountable to God. Word of God, word of life. The Holy Gospel according to Matthew, the 18th chapter. Then Peter came to Jesus and said to him, Lord, if another member of the church sins against me, how often should I forgive? As many as seven times? Jesus said to him, not seven times, but I tell you, 77 times. For this reason, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his slaves. When he began his reckoning, one who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him, and as he could not pay, his Lord ordered him to be sold 
together with his wife and children and all his possessions, and payment to be made. So the slave fell on his knees before the king, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the lord of that slave released him and forgave him the debt. But that same slave, as he went out, came upon one of his fellow slaves, who owed him a hundred denarii. And seizing him by the throat, he said, Pay what you owe. Then his fellow slave fell down and pleaded with him, Have patience with me, and I will repay you. But the slave refused. And then he went and threw him into prison until he could pay the debt. When the fellow slaves saw what had happened, they were greatly distressed. And they went and reported to their Lord all that has taken place. Then his Lord summoned him and said to him, You wicked slave, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. Should you not have had mercy on your fellow slave? as I had mercy on you. And in anger, his Lord handed him over to be tortured until he would pay his entire debt. So my heavenly Father will also do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother or sister from your heart. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Let us pray. Gracious and almighty God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts and our minds be acceptable and pleasing in your sight. For you are our rock and our redeemer. And we give you thanks. Amen. We're with our friend and our mentor, Peter, again today. In today's Gospel reading, Peter is asking a follow-up question to last week's lesson. Last week in Matthew 18, verses 15 through 20, Jesus was talking about how to correct someone in the faith community who has sinned. How do you bring them back into the fold? So today's lesson is Peter's question from the front row of the disciples' classroom. And he raises his hand kind of like Hermione Granger and asks what he thinks is a brilliant question. How often should I forgive someone who sins against me? Seven times? See, Peter wants to seem like he's wise. He wants to act like he knows what Jesus is about. Jesus is someone who wants us to forgive. So Peter quantifies it. He puts a number on it. And seven seems like a lot, so that's what he goes with. And once again, Jesus' response to Peter astounds us. Not seven times, 77 times. Or in some translations, it's worse, 70 times seven times. Infinitely more than Peter had dreamed of. Forgive, forgive, and forgive again. That's what Jesus is telling us. The parable that Jesus tells us really stops us in our tracks because this is what forgiveness looks like. It looks like a king who forgives a 10,000 talent debt. One talent is 6,000 denarii. One denarii is a day's wage for the common laborer. So this is a 60 million denarii debt. Let's translate that. 60 million denarii is 164,383 years of working 365 days a year. One person owing that much shows both the deep need of the servant and the unending generosity of the king. And with one simple request, the king forgives it all, wipes away the debt, and lets the servant go free from it. Wow. This 
second half of the parable is what forgiveness does not look like. That same servant who has just been forgiven finds a colleague who owes him a hundred denarii debt, 100 days wages. Again, it's a significant sum, but it is paltry compared to what the first servant owed to the king. And this servant was not gracious, was not generous, was not forgiving. He throws his fellow slave into debtor's prison and he shows the world that he has completely failed to learn the lesson of forgiveness that was just modeled to him. So I have a question for you. Who amongst us thinks it's easy to forgive? Raise your hands. I don't see any hands raised because forgiveness is really, really hard to do. And yet, this is exactly what Jesus is asking of us. Forgive your brother or your sister from your heart. So I want to take that directive apart, just that one part of this story. To forgive does not mean to forget. It does not mean to sweep it under the rug. To forgive doesn't mean to put it on the back burner and just walk away from it for a little while. To forgive is to, quote, cease to feel resentment against someone or something that has offended you, according to Merriam-Webster's dictionary. To forgive is also to grant relief to someone who owes you. To forgive someone is to release someone and wipe away what is rightfully yours. Forgiveness is something that we do. Doesn't depend on the person who has wronged us, coming to us first and apologizing. That is really nice when that happens. There's a completeness to it. But Jesus didn't say to us, when your sister or brother comes to you and offers a deep, heartfelt apology and promises to never do that thing that really bothered you ever again, then forgive them. No, that's not what Jesus said. Jesus tells us to forgive. It's a choice. It's an action that we take. And it is a clearing of the slate. If we sweep the wrongs under the rug, then we're going to trip over them every time we walk by. If we put things on the back burner, they're going to continue to simmer and trouble us. If we continue to hold on to the forgiveness, and if we refuse to give it away, then we're holding on to the hurt and to the resentment and to the pain. And that hurts our relationship. And it drives wedges between family members and between communities and between nations. But when we forgive, we let go. And finally, suddenly we find that we're free to move forward. And we find that we're no longer stuck in neutral, no longer stuck in that rut. We are free to move. Forgive your brother or your sister. Forgiveness is about restoring relationships. When we're in conflict with one another, when we hold on to the wrong, when we fail to forgive, we can barely stand to call each other family. We don't want to admit that we belong to each other because disowning seems like a better option in many cases. But Jesus says, forgive, restore that relationship. Remember that you are a beloved child of God and that person is a beloved child of God and you are in the same family, your brothers and sisters in Christ. So act like it, forgive. There's an amazing story I heard this week it happened last October in Dallas, Texas. Former police officer Amber Greiger was convicted of murder of her neighbor, Botham Jean. You may remember the story. In 2008, this police officer coming off a 13 hour long shift 
went home late at night and she entered the wrong apartment. She thought it was her apartment and she found a man sitting on her couch eating ice cream. She immediately feared for her life and fatally shot Botham Jean through the heart. It was a tragedy because Botham Jean was in his own apartment and she had made the fatal mistake of going through the wrong door. Geiger was convicted of murder. And the next day at her sentencing hearing, Botham's younger brother, Brandt, took the stand. And in video that you can see on YouTube of this, he speaks directly to Geiger, telling her that she should come to God and find forgiveness because he had gone to God and had sought to find a way to right this wrong. And he said directly to her, I forgive you. And then in a moment that shocked everyone, Brandt turns to the judge and says, please, can I, can I hug her, please? And after a moment, the judge grants him his request and he comes down out of the witness stand and he meets his brother's murder in the middle of the courtroom and they hug hard and they hold on tight and they both are crying. You can actually on the audio hear the courtroom crying around them. And as the camera pans back a bit, you see the judge wiping at her eyes. Here, a grieving young black man hugs a guilty white police officer and he offers her forgiveness. When we're forgiven, that's what it feels like. It feels like finding grace where you don't deserve it. You find community where you thought you had destroyed everything. To be forgiven means to be given the chance to reform ourselves and to try again 70 times, seven times if we're really slow learners. And when we forgive, we change the systems that are unjust and abusive and oppressive. When we forgive, we break the cycles of anger and retaliation and isolation. To forgive is to honor the relationship more than the hurt. When we forgive, we refuse to allow the past to dictate our future. Every time we pray the Lord's Prayer, we're practicing this. We are reminding ourselves of this. Forgive us our debts, our sins, our trespasses, as we forgive our debtors and those who sin and trespass against us. Forgive your brothers and your sisters from your heart. Where does Jesus say we need to forgive them from? From the very core of who we are. Forgiveness is a really hard thing, and we have to dredge it up from the center of who we are. Forgiveness comes from the heart. Way back when, before COVID, when I would go to the gym, I participated in a class every Friday morning called the TRX class. I both loved it and I hated it. The workout uses your own body weight against you, and it's hard work. The worst part of it was that each and every exercise worked your core. My fellow students and I would grumble and complain and we would try to keep up with the teacher and he would patiently explain to us week after week that these core exercises would give us strength and make us stronger and more stable. To practice forgiveness means that we have to focus in on our core, on our hearts, the core of our faith. And when we forgive, we're exercising our hearts and we're strengthening and stabilizing ourselves. That is what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ. It means that we remember that we have been forgiven. 
It means that we practice what it is that we have received. As Christ forgave us, so we turn and forgive others. We become the witness on the stand who offers the defendant another chance. We become the one who opens our arms and welcomes the offender back into the fold. Jesus modeled this for us on the cross at the end of Luke's gospel. Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. May we be as gracious, as generous, and as forgiving. May it be so. Amen. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father. And he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Additions to our prayers this week include Karen Lampson O'Leary, Jetty Lampson's daughter. Drawn together in the compassion of God, we pray for the church, the world, and all those in need. You welcome us when we are weak in faith. Uphold your church throughout the world. Make it a place of welcome. Strengthen faith through Bible studies and Sunday schools, confirmation classes and youth ministries. Nurture new ministries of education and growth. Lord of life, hear our prayer. The heights of heaven show us the vastness of your steadfast love. Have compassion on your creation. Where human selfishness has brought ruin and destruction, we look to you to heal, renew, and redeem your world. Lord of life, hear our prayer. 
Make your ways known to the nations. Speak kindness to our bitter grudges. Settle our hearts when we want to settle accounts with violence. Bless our leaders with patience and wisdom. Lord of life, hear our prayer. Bring healing and justice wherever harm is felt. Provide vindication for all who are oppressed. Free victims of human trafficking and forced labor. Deliver all who are bound by debt. Feed all who hunger and guard refugees fleeing famine, poverty, and war. Lord of life, hear our prayer. Teach us to forgive. Remind us that you do not always accuse us. Still our tongues when we are tempted to pass judgment and argue over opinions. Make this congregation a community of mercy for one another and for all our neighbors. Lord of life, hear our prayer. Here, if you have other intercessions, this is the time to offer them. Whether we live or whether we die, we are yours. We thank you for those who have showed us faithfulness, for the knees that have taught us how to bow to you and the tongues that taught us to praise you. Especially John Chrysostom, Bishop of Constantinople, whom we commemorate today. Lord of life, hear our prayer. All these things and whatever else you see that we need, we entrust to your mercy through Christ our Lord. Amen. I invite you to join me in praying as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen.
when we used to gather together for worship, right at the end of the service, when I would stand at the back doors of the church and say, go in peace to love and serve the Lord, everyone responded with, thanks be to God. And one other voice, two other voices, calling out above all the others, thanks be to God, we will. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord, we will. May it be so. May we go from this place and treat others the way that Christ has treated us. May we go from this place and practice mercy, the same mercy that we received from Christ. May we go from this place, spreading love and hope and grace to all that we meet, for that is what we have received. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God, we will. Amen.